Hey, Chloe. We'll wait a few minutes, see who else shows up. There's David, Jocelyn, Zavia. Haley, Kyra, Nyla, Jose, Wait about a minute. Jacqueline. <clears throat> Betsy's here. I'm up to 13, 14. Remember the first day we did this, I had 20 people here. I'm down to 13 now. I'll wait about a minute more and then we'll get started. All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started because it's 104. I've got 13 people here, so I guess we will get started. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything at the moment? Yeah. Nobody saying anything. What are uh, Reaganomics or the uh, Ronald Reagan? Okay, what about it? What are Reagan? Oh, what is Reaganomics? Yeah. Uh, it's basically this economic plan that Reagan and his team came up with when he took office. Um, basically, the idea is that if you cut taxes and you cut regulations on businesses, that will increase demand. Or no, it won't increase demand, I'm sorry. It'll increase supply in the economy. And anytime you increase supply, prices drop. And when prices drop, that's going to help out people as far as being able to pay their bills and have more money to spend in the economy. Okay. Anything else? Um. No. I don't think so. Okay. Hey, somebody, you know, Amy has joined us. Okay. Um, well, 
Um, one thing I want to go ahead and well, maybe I'll save it to the end. Maybe a few more people will show up. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just do a run through of the three skeletons I've got in front of me. Um, as I go through them, if something doesn't make sense or if you've got anything you want to say, that's fine. Um, and we'll do that. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the first one from Friday the 27th. Um, basically, um, I think we were talking last time as far as how someone's got a bad echo game. But um, we were going over like reduced um, birth and reduced death rates as far as how that affected population. Um, there were environmental factors that we're supposed to go over. Um, a lot of them have to do with diseases. Um, you know, this would tend to keep population from growing uh, faster. Um, they talk about, um, i trying to think, um, a lot of uh, diseases related uh, to poverty in a lot of your developing countries, um, malaria, tuberculosis, cholera, um, epidemic diseases, which I thought somebody might want to get into today. Uh, he had the 1918 uh, Spanish flu at the end of World War One, which, you know, considering 100 years later what's going on now, I thought somebody might be interested in going over that. A lot of similarities. Um, Ebola, HIV and AIDS. Um, you have ones that go with increased life spans the longer you live the more likely you are to get diseases like heart disease cancer alzheimer's parkinson's things people didn't really worry about a hundred years ago because not a lot enough people lived long enough to deal with those problems or have to deal with those problems hey i'm up to 15 all right um <clears throat> let's see also, environmental changes, uh, deforestation, uh, the effects that has on oxygen and CO2 um, emissions, which it does, desertification, um, you know, you're overusing farmlands and causes lands to turn into deserts because there's no water left to keep everything from drying up. Uh, air quality, uh, that was bad in the developed world 50 years or so ago. They decided to deal with it. Most of the air quality now is okay, but it's really bad in places like China and India, uh, Latin America too. Um, fresh water is a big problem. The Green Revolution, you can grow more food, but there's only a finite amount of water and as the population goes up and industrialization goes up, the need for water rises, but there's not enough fresh water to deal with that, um, especially in places like the Middle East, um, South Asia, North Africa, uh, West Africa, places like that, you have the problem of, you know, people threatening violence against each other for water access. Um, and then you have the greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane are the biggest ones that, you know, contribute to uh, climate change, sea level rise, all that kind of stuff. So that's Friday, March 27th. And I've, I feel like I'm talking to myself because nobody's coming at me with anything. So does anybody have anything yet? Uh, so they said um, in the um, Spanish influenza article that there was no like vaccine or antibiotic that can like fight against it. Did they ever find one or did it just never? Well, if you, if you look at the skeleton I put next to the 1918 pandemic, the fact that it mutated. Um, the 1918 um, flu was a type of, I think it was bird flu that mutated. And since, you know, like any new disease, like the bubonic plague, 
it wiped people out early on. And then as people adapted and got used to it, it became less deadly over time. So you still have versions of that pandemic around today, like the, the flu that, that not everybody, but a lot of people get every year. Like when you think of the flu and you get the flu shot or whatever, that's a version of that 1918 flu. And so when people are prescribed Tamiflu or get the flu shot or what have you, that is directed at a version of that flu from 1918. Um, so they didn't really have anything back then. Um, it's still a problem today. Um, there are not a lot of medicines that treat viruses, antibiotics. I think we talked about this last week. Antibiotics treat bacteria um, much more than they do viruses. Um, there are vaccines more for viruses. Um, so that's something they're looking at as far as now with the current situation. But it takes a while for vaccines to be developed. All right. So do you think that it'll mutate now? Like the coronavirus now will mutate? Um, it it probably will, but like the 1918 um, virus mutated also. Um, but the human body plus the treatments for the 1918 flu kind of kept up with it. So it didn't become as big of a deal over time. Um, one of the things that, they're, that they've been looking at, there's a few things they've been looking at. Um, one, there's a drug that was used to treat malaria in the 1940s that they're thinking of using um, on coronavirus people um, as far as it knocks some of the symptoms down so the body's better able to handle the infection. Um, the, vi the vaccine is still a ways off. Um, what they're thinking might happen is that it might, um, you know, with all this social distancing, plus the fact the weather getting warmer, um, you know, it might kind of knock itself out by the time uh, summer starts. But they're thinking it might go down and get big in, in the southern part of the world and then come back in the winter. I mean, this is all speculation. Nobody really knows. So anything else about um, diseases or maybe this environmental stuff we we're supposed to look over? Up to 16 now. Who's joined us? I got Mr. Pass in here. I got 15 students. Okay. Anything else about diseases, environment, anything along those lines? Not for me. Okay. Um, the next thing we're supposed to go over, and this would have been Tuesday if we were still in school, um, was economics. And there was a whole bunch of stuff in there. Haley had already talked about some of them. If it was Haley or Chloe. I'll, I'll always mix you two up. I'm sorry. But, um, one of you all asked about Reaganomics, um, and that was a big thing as far as kind of jump-starting the West um, in the 1980s. Throughout the 70s, the West economy pretty much was sucking eggs. They were not doing well at all. A lot of it had to do with the uh, OPEC embargo. Um, have you guys had to read about that yet, or have I? Oh, no, I did. A, a, yeah, that was part of this little thing, I think, was the OPEC embargo. Um, can any of you all tell me anything about that? About anything on the on the skeleton or just the OPEC? The, the OPEC situation. It was like oil, like the people... It was like it said countries including Algeria, Ecuador, Gabon, Indonesia, Iran, 
Libya, Nigeria. They basically, like, in Venezuela, they were, like, third world countries who would get, like, oil. It was, like, raw materials. And they would yeah, sell well, them on the world country. Right. They've got the raw materials. They understand the industrialized world needs that oil. And since they have not fully industrialized, they don't have as much demand for it. So those countries that you mentioned decided to band together to say, hey, if we control what we sell, we'll be able to get a better price for it. We'll be able to get more money for our own countries and develop ourselves uh, more efficiently. And so um, the countries you mentioned, along with uh, several others, the, most of the ones you didn't mention were in the Middle East, um, Saudi Arabia, Iraq. I think the the uh, UAE is in there, um, and some others. Um, them, plus the ones you did mention, uh, controlled most of the world's oil supply in the 1970s. And so they were upset at the West for supporting Israel in that war that we mentioned before we all, you know, everything hit the fan. And we didn't come to school anymore. Does any do any of y'all remember that whole setup? I think we went over the setup, like when you were talking about why gas is so cheap. Well, the the thing where um, Israel was created in the 1940s, and then the neighboring Arab states around them went to war repeatedly with Israel, and they lost every time. Oh, the war, like, you're asking us what war we went over? Well, I'm not, it doesn't have to be spe a specific war, but that whole scenario where several times in the mid-20th century, the Arab states tried to jump Israel, do a rapid sneak attack war kind of thing, wipe Israel out, and it never worked. Wasn't it because Israel was, like, kind of like the... Like a little state of God? Or well, they, they see themselves that way, so they're very motivated. Um, they're also uh, very... And, like, everybody hates the, like, the Jewish people, so, like, that kind of just, you know, <laughs> didn't help, I guess. Right, so you have, you have all that going for Israel, plus the fact that Israel, you know, a lot of the people who started the state of Israel were very highly educated. They were World War II veterans for different allied states. Um, you know, so they knew how to fight. They're able to uh, make good income. They use that income to buy weapons from the United States and other countries. And so, you know, the Israel always won these wars, but you had this big war in the early 1970s um, where the Arab states decided to use OPEC since the Arab states controlled about two thirds of OPEC. They decided to use OPEC to tell the West, Hey, if you're going to support Israel in this war, we're going to cut off your oil supplies. And so Western Europe, I don't know if Japan was part of this too, but Western Europe for sure, Canada, the United States, you know, all the ones who supported Israel, they said, we're not going to sell you oil anymore. And the price of oil jumped, you know, by triple, quadruple in less than a year. So, like, it's like if you, you know, like now you're paying like a buck fifty for gas because the economy stinks. But, like, if you went to the gas station a month from now and gas was six dollars a gallon, you know, I mean, that would rock everybody because. You know, all of the stuff you buy in the store gets there by truck. And so the trucks, you know, they're going to spend more to transport your food. Your airplanes use jet fuel, which is a type which is from oil. Your, your transport uh, ships that I showed you all last week, you know, they use diesel, which is from oil. So all of those transport costs skyrocket. So the price of food goes up, the price of clothes goes up, the price of furniture, everything else you buy goes up. And so what's going to happen to the economies in the 70s, guys? It's going to 
I'm just gonna like be corrupt because everything is more expensive and you wouldn't have enough money to pay for it. Right. So what you have in the West are these economic recessions in most of your Western economies. Um, even when the embargo ends, it, the, the governments don't really have a good way to pick things back up. So it's just lagging all throughout the 70s. And then in the 80s, Reagan shows up and Thatcher shows up in Britain and says, let's do things a different way that nobody else was thinking about. And it worked. It picked those economies up. And so the rest of the world noticed that, too. This is when you get um, Augusto Pinochet in Chile to use that model in his country. Um, and you have China use it under Deng Xiaoping after um, Mao dies. Um, and these, you know, Chile is not a democratic country. China is not a democratic country. Um, I think we talked about what China did at the end of the Cold War recently, didn't we? They had like a, like they reset everything, kind of. Like they get they forgot everything about Taoism, right? Not Taoism. Uh, the Confucius. No, the the, Wait, no. the Maoism. Maoism. Yeah. Well, remember Mao was had a couple of things going. Remember Mao is seen as a diehard what guys? Communist. Right. But Deng, he believed in communism, but he did, but he wanted to modify it so that there were elements of capitalism in it. Um, do you guys not remember like what happened in Beijing in 1989? The wall, Berlin Wall. Berlin Walls in Berlin, Aiden. <laughs> well, like... I'm saying, like, it fell, right? You said what happened in 1989? <laughs> in, in Berlin. So, in... in um, Berlin is in what part of the world, guys? Germany. Germany. Europe. In Europe. Oh, so, oh, wait. In, in Europe, communism fell apart from 1989... 1991 um, but that didn't happen in China um, didn't didn't we go over the whole thing in Tiananmen Square oh the protest yeah right protest. And, and what happened when the Chinese students protested they uh, got off correct so um, Deng Xiaoping was the leader of China during that whole time. So Deng Xiaoping believes in capitalism, but he's not going to see the Communist Party get overthrown and become a Western-style democracy. There was no way he was going to let that happen. Um, people like power, and Deng was not going to lose that power to democracy. Because every time communists allow an election, what has happened like over 90% of the time? It was like What happens when communists hold fair elections almost all the time? It's not fair. Well, that would be a not fair election. My question is let's let's there are a few examples of this. The communists say let's not rig this election. Let's have a real election and have the people really say what they really want and we'll count the votes fairly. And whatever they decide, will go with that. The when, whenever they do that, which is not very often, whenever they do that, what's the result almost all the time? They would go against communism, right? Or Yeah, they, they'd vote them out. You know, that happened in Eastern Europe in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so the Chinese aren't going to allow that. So what I'm trying to tell you is Deng Xiaoping allowed capitalism while keeping the communist control of the government. You still have a communist secret police. 
You still have communist run prison systems. You still have, you know, restrictions on freedom of the press and freedom of speech, um, freedom of religion. Those things still do not exist in China. Pretty much what China decided to do was, you know, say, hey, let's incentivize, excuse me, let's incentivize hard work, let's incentivize creativity, but let's do it in a way that it's going to make China stronger while we keep our power for ourselves. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you guys see what Pinochet did with Allende in Chile? You said Pinochet? Yeah, Augusto Pinochet. Like in Latin America? Correct. Isn't it like similar to China? He he was like it was like adjusted social capitalism. Well, what he did, well, Allende was the communist, and so when he took over, remember Augusto Pinochet was a military general, and this happens um, not a whole lot, but it happens enough to notice in Latin America. You have the military decide to overthrow governments down there from time to time and this is another example of that so you had general pinochet overthrow um allende and allende was a communist socialist kind of on the border and pinochet ruled as a military dictator um but and he was a brutal guy he he rounded up a bunch of allende supporters in a soccer stadium and machine gunned them all um, Allende was killed, um, some say by suicide, some say by uh, Pinochet's uh, soldiers. Um, but Pinochet liked this idea, like Deng Xiaoping, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, you have to loosen up restrictions on the economy to have the economy take off, and it worked in those places. Um, looking at some other things. Questions as far as this economic setup is concerned? No, sir. All right. Um, you've got a lot of um, innovations in technology and communications as far as manufacturing goes. Um, you have economies that are built more on um, working with that information to succeed. Uh, the skeleton lists a few places. Uh, Finland, I think, I'm trying to think what comes from, I think Nokia phones came out of Finland. Nokia was like one of the early um, cell phone companies that took off. Um, Estonia, um, that's where uh, Skype came from. Um, so you have your idea of video chats, you know, come out of there. Um, Japan, you know, we got lots of technology from Japan. Uh, Sony, you know, all of your Sony um, entertainment systems like PlayStation. Um, you have, oh, gosh. Um, they used to make TVs a lot. Um, you know, there's lots of Sony things out there. That's all Japanese. South Korea, you have um, Samsung is based out of South Korea. Um, I'm trying to think. And then you got the United States, um, you know, Microsoft, um, Tesla, Amazon. You know, these are all knowledge-based systems. Um, a lot of your factories that make this stuff, a lot of that's in South and Southeast Asia. You know, Vietnam, Bangladesh, um, a lot of your other uh, manufacturing economies are in Latin America. A lot of your textiles, um, cars, different things like that are made in Mexico, Honduras. They're imported into the uh, U.S. and other countries. Um, you have a lot of uh, trade blocks. Um, 
any of you guys get any impressions or questions about the trade blocks that are going on at this time? They're still a big deal today. Trade blocks as in like ports and stuff? Well, trade blocks are like, like OPEC, for example, is a trade block. You have a group of countries that have a common goal. They work together. If you're in the trade block, you can pretty much trade with each other without any restrictions or very little in the way of restrictions. And so the ones who you do business with, you're trying to make money off of them while protecting your members. Would that like, be like the Southeast Asian nations? Yeah. So you have this group called um, ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian nation. So basically, like, if you're in Vietnam, you're allowed to trade with Thailand and vice versa. And so you're doing that because you believe, like, it's like you're a family, you know, and this group of countries that are a family here, they don't want to hurt members of the family by saying, well, hey, you know, this shirt's from Thailand. You got to pay double what a Vietnamese shirt costs because that'd be like, you know, smacking your brother in the face. So you allow the members to trade with each other, fine. But if you something's coming from the outside of the family, like coming from China, India, the United States, you're like, hey, you know, they're trying to hurt our family. And so we're going to make their goods more expensive. And so that's kind of how a trade block works. It works the same with all of them. ASEAN works that way. Um, Mercosur, um, which is in Latin America, works that way. NAFTA works that way, which has just been replaced by a new thing called the USMCA, but it's the same thing. Um, the EU works that way. Um, I think I said OPEC works that way. The only one that's a little bit different is the WTO. And the WTO is open to every country in the world that wants to be a member of it. It's kind of like a UN of trade. Pretty much what the WTO wants is to get rid of all trade restrictions as long as the members agree by certain principles. So if like China, you know, tries to put restrictions on American trade, the U.S. can go to the WTO and say, hey, they're breaking the rules and the WTO can make a ruling or a decision on that situation. But most of the trade is dealt with through these trade groups. Um, most countries around the world either are or want to be members of one of these groups because it allows you that free trade within that group. Anything else about the trade uh, groups? I guess not. Um, what do you guys uh, read about these multinational corporations? What does it just sound like it means? Multinational corporation. Like they all work together? They're all around the world. Mm -hmm. Well, you have a company, and you can pick whichever one, or you can look at the skeleton that way, that does business all around the world. Um, they, started, they, have, they started in America, but they would sell all around the world. Well, some of them are American, uh, but not all of them are American. Like What's Microsoft it? is an American multinational corporation. Starbucks and McDonald's are American multinational corporations, but not all of them are. Uh, the ones that they have listed in your skeleton were purposely picked as non-American multinational corporations. Is this like the T and C thing? T and C? T 
TNC, like, yeah, they're top. Oh, TNC, yeah, yeah. Those are the transnational corporations. It's the same thing. TNC and multinationals are the same things. Okay. Um, there's there's a transnational corporation within walking distance of the high school that is not based in the United States. What do you think? Um, I don't, there's not, is there even a Nissan dealer in Lexington? I don't know. I just know there's a car dealership by the high school. I thought it was George. That, that's Jerry Hunt, I think. Oh, John, you're wondering. Um, the, the Shell station. Shell is based out of the Netherlands. Um, but they sell gas all over the world. So whenever you buy gas from that shell station, some of that money is going to wind up back in the Netherlands because that's where shell is based out of. Um, but um, you mentioned Nissan. Um, where is Nissan based out of? Is Netherlands, do they have a language like it's shell Netherlands? Um, the, the language of the Netherlands is Dutch. Um, shell Dutch. Sorry. Is the word shell Dutch? Um, no, they picked an English word. I don't know why. I guess they saw the writing on the wall. Um, but the, the name of the company is Royal Dutch Shell. They were, are they? Nissan's from Japan, I think. Yeah, Nissan's Japanese. Um, they have Nestle on your skeleton. Um, Nestle is Swiss. So anytime you buy like Nestle Crunch Bars, there's some other. Um, I think Kit Kat is Nestle. So that money goes back there. Um, I'm trying to think of some more. Uh, they have Mahindra on your skeleton. Uh, does anyone have has any of y'all heard of Mahindra? No. The Indian? They're Aren't they like cars? Out. No, I don't think Mahindra makes cars. Um Mahindra I know makes lawnmowers and tractors and things like that. Um so but the, yeah they are based out of India. Um Trying to think of some more that are not based in the United States. Sony's one, of course. We already mentioned Sony earlier. Um, Sam yeah, Samsung we mentioned earlier. Um, I'm trying to think. LG is somewhere. I can't think of where, but LG is another one. I know LG is based out of Europe. I just forget which country LG comes from um, trying to think. Oh, I'm looking at my little Lenovo and Lenovo's based out of North Carolina but their factories are in China um, that's your world trade thing going on but I'm, yeah I'm, I'm stumping out of non-American multi nationals um, but you get the idea right guys yeah Right. Yeah. Um, the last one I've got that I'm looking at, um, the one we would have went over in class today if we lived in a normal world, which we don't, um, is it's looking at social categories, roles, and practices have been maintained and challenged. So let's see. We've got challenging old assumptions about race class, gender, religion. Um, a lot of this stuff we've talked about before, haven't we? We've talked about like the, the expansion of the rights of women. We've talked about um, the negritude movement. Um, correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. And I think we've talked about um, like Islamic fundamentalism in Egypt and Saudi Arabia too, haven't we? 
Can you repeat that? Have we talked about like um, like um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and like the the Wahhabi? Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think that was last week or maybe the week. Wait. Right. So I'm trying not to have us repeat stuff in the notes if we can help it. Um, let's see, liberation theology that we haven't talked about, correct? Right. I don't okay. know what that is. Yeah, liberation theology is kind of hard to figure out at first. Um, basically, liberation theology is this idea in Latin America where they try to take two popular ideas down there and combine them, all right? So somebody try to figure out one or both of these two popular ideas in Latin America in a lot of society and in culture down there. Isn't it socialism? Socialism's one part. And, and then, Catholicism? And, like and the Catholic Church is the other part. So social, uh, not social, liberation theology is, is trying to take socialism and combine it with Catholicism, where it's saying that, like, you know, God or Jesus wants you to come up with socialist programs to help the poor. All right. That's kind of what liberation theology is. Um, it's, it's been rough down there trying to get that to go through because of the way that would work. Um, of course, who runs the Catholic Church? Oh. Okay. So what would you have to do to make liberation theology work down there? I heard Pope someone say, the Pope? say that again. Do you have to have a Pope? You do have to have the Pope, but what would the Pope have to do in regards to liberation theology? Learn about it? Not just learn about it, but what else? Oh, practice it. Correct. Okay. And this is the problem with liberation theology from the people who want it. All right. You have to get the Pope to agree to it or else the Pope. And this is still true to in 2020. If you piss off the Pope and you're a Catholic, what can the Pope do to you? Like then you. Yeah. Correct. They, they can kick you out of the church. And if you believe in Catholicism, you're risking your your soul in the afterlife. And so the problem with liberation theology is this. Until a few years ago, every pope that was said liberation theology was awful. Because look at who your popes were. You know, in the 1970s, John Paul II became pope. He was pope until 2005. And do any of y'all remember where John Paul II's from? John Paul. Mm. Like a continent or like a country or right, that's what I'm asking. John John Second. Yeah, John Paul the Second. Poland. Correct. And smart, smart. So one of the things that John Paul the Second's gonna say is he's not gonna believe in liberation theology because he knows what socialism and communism can do to a people. And he says, hey, this is bad news. I know what it's like because I've lived under this system for 35 years. This is bad news. So he's not going to support it. And then when he dies in 2005, one of his BFFs becomes Pope, and that's Benedict XVI, and he's going to do the same thing John Paul II did. And now Benedict XVI is still alive, but he quit like five, six, seven, you know, a few years ago. And Francis is the Pope. And where's Francis from?
Argentina? Correct. He's, yeah, Jocelyn said that. And Argentina's in Latin America. And so he knows what, you know, people were wanting. He has felt a lot of the pain they've had. He has never lived under a socialist system, so he does not have the firsthand knowledge that John Paul II has had. And so he hasn't come out and said, hey, let's go ahead and do this. But, you know, he, he says a lot of things in his sermons where he says, hey, we can't forget about the poor, the government has a role to play, that kind of thing. So it's not like a full endorsement of liberation theology, but it like kind of gets the people who like it to say, hey, Francis is kind of on our side. And so this is why, you know, yeah. it's talked about. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Um, the skeleton talks about more and more women getting the right to vote. Um, we've talked about ending segregation in the United States in one of our earlier things about Martin Luther King. Am I correct on that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I want to go ahead and get into apartheid, apartheid and the untouchables in India and we'll be pretty close to the end. Um, one of your homework questions that three of you have done so far was about um, the difference as far as um, white rule in India versus white rule in South Africa. All right. Um, did anybody figure out what the difference is as far as how that ended? You said the difference between white rule in India and in Africa? South Africa. South Africa? Mm -hmm. Isn't South Africa like majority of them are white? No, it's actually the other way around. Uh, only 10% of the people in South Africa are white, but, you, but they set up this system to protect their rule of the government. Because it wasn't apartheid like segregation? Yeah, it's, it's like segregation, but it's on steroids. Um, they would, they would um, categorize every person in South Africa into one of four racial groups. You would either be categorized, and you had like, and it would be like on your, um, your ID card that you would walk around in public. And just like in a non-democratic country the police can stop and ask you for your papers 24 7 anywhere you go that was true in south africa and your papers would say whether you were either white black indian or colored those were the four groups What's in colored? south africa um when they say colored they mean uh anybody of a mixed race oh. so the white group was the one with the least amount of restrictions um, as far as where they could be, what kind of jobs they could have. Um, and, the, and the government didn't distinguish between British ancestry or Dutch ancestry. Remember, that goes back to the Boer War. Um, so both groups were considered white, and so both groups had full rights. The next group down were, I think, the Indians... They had some restrictions, but it wasn't as bad as it was with uh, black people were. And then the colored group was like in between that. And I'm going to pull up a map real quick if you'll give me a second. Um, it's going to show you like how bad it was under apartheid. If I can get this to work. There we go. So open that up and blow that up. That'll work. So let me present this real quick. All right. Can y'all see the map real quick? 
Yeah. All right. Everything that is purple on this map was a different country. So you got Namibia, Botswana, Lesotho, and so on. Everything that's not purple is the country of South Africa. And the this beige color, I don't know what color you call it, that's like 80% of the map. Um, you guys see that color dominate, correct? Yes. Okay. That land, only white people were allowed to live there. Um, if other races wanted to live there, they had to get permission from either a company that they worked for. And remember, you can only work certain jobs. So, like, you couldn't have uh, a black African doctor, for instance. You know, they would not be allowed to be doctors. All right. But, like, you had to get permission from the company you worked for or the person who owned the land had to give you permission to be in that land. And so, like, if you were in Cape Province, down near the Cape of Good Hope, you know, where Cape Town was or Johannesburg was, and they saw like, oh, well, that person's not white. Hey, I'm going to check your papers. And if they checked your papers and you did not have legal permission in those papers, you could be arrested on the spot for violation apartheid orders. So it's, it's even, it's, it's, e that's why I call it segregation on steroids. It's, it's even worse than the South had because the Southern United States did not say, hey, you know, we're going to reserve West Virginia for this race and, you know, white people get to live everywhere else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So Mandela was the guy who fought against that, and he was sent to prison for life for fighting against that. Um, in the 1980s, the world decided to slap uh, trade restrictions on South Africa for its apartheid because in the 80s, they actually made it worse than it had been. And so it got so bad, South Africa was going broke, and they uh, decided to let Mandela out of prison. It was either in 89 or 1990, I forget which. And... Um, Excuse me. And the leader of South Africa was a guy called F.W. de Klerk, and he decided to allow for free elections for all races. And once that happened, the fact that you have 80% of the population as African, they're going to vote for Mandela. He's, you know, a big hero, you know, and uh, that's the end of apartheid. Um, India, they had this system where they tried to protect the untouchable class. Remember, because what religion regarded the Hindus, or not, oh, I just gave it away, never mind. So, you know, the Hindus, <laughs> so the Hindus, you know, they tried to uh, discriminate against untouchables, and so the Constitution set aside a certain percentage of untouchables to be represented in parliament. Um, this was meant to be a temporary thing, but every time the protection was set to expire, the Indian government recognized that, that untouchables were still being discriminated against, so they kept renewing that provision of the Constitution. I think it's still in effect. Um, and then you've got environmental movements. Uh, you got Greenpeace. Um, any of you guys heard of Greenpeace? Aware of what Greenpeace is? Uh, isn't it like it's trying to make the world like a cleaner place without like violence? Right, yeah. right. So they they try to like you know draw attention to you know environmental problems, or sometimes you know they'll confront uh, 
whale hunters or you know people who cut down uh, rainforest or things like that. Um, so you know they're they're like an activist group. Um, you have the Green Belt movement in Kenya, which tries to protect the savannas and the wildlife there. Uh, the reason the College Board likes the Green Belt movement is because it's led by women. Um, and then you have Earth Day, um, which is coming up in a few weeks, uh, which actually started in the U.S. as kind of a one-day protest, and it kind of grew from there. So, questions about any of this stuff? No. Um, yeah, uh, one other thing I wanted to get into that, uh, before I wrapped up, um, have you guys been getting my emails as far as, like, information, what's going on and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, excuse me. Um, I'm trying to think. They're going to, um. They haven't released dates or whatever yet. They're supposed to do that tomorrow for the exam. But um, I've, I've assigned you guys um, on AP Classroom a bunch of things, and so far nobody has done any of them. Um, I just got my login today. I had okay. to get the password. But yeah, I'm in there now. So you had to reset it? Mm -hmm. But I'm in there now. I logged in okay. today. Okay. But it was okay. at like 1230, so I didn't have time to like to do an assignment. Yeah, that's fine. I just want you guys to do some of those practice things in there. One of the things that worries me and worries me more than any of the classes I've taught since I've started teaching AP is – and I'm, I'm looking at Kyra, but Kyra is not one of the ones I'm worried about, really. I'll knock on, on wood real quick for that. It is, is the writing part. Um, from what I understand, and I'm going to know more about this tomorrow, hopefully. From what I understand, this 45-minute exam is not going to have any multiple choice on it. Yeah, I did the same thing when I saw it, and it still pisses me off but there's nothing that I can do about it. So what I think is going to happen is and this is, this is, this is what I think is going to happen. Okay. Remember how we talked about SAQ should take about 15 minutes a piece. We don't get three of them. That's my thought. That's what I oh, think I is going to happen. Oh, Jesus. It's because <laughs> it takes 15 minutes a piece, right? You have three of them, and it should work out. So what I think they're going to do is they're going to give you an SAQ on, like, you know, unit one, you know, my unit one, okay? Like, you know, 1,200 to 1,450. Then they're going to give you another SAQ from, like, 1,450 to 1,750. And then they're going to give you another SAQ from, like, 1,750 to 1,900. And they're just going to make you do those. That's what I think is going to happen. Are we going to like have time to review? Or? That's why I assigned you guys stuff on AP Classroom. So you can do some of these SAQs. I can give you feedback and we can kind of do that. <clears throat> Another thing that's going to have to happen is you're going to have to download the secure browser from College Board. Um, I'm going to have to send you a link. If you have a laptop um, then you or a tablet, then you just click on the link and download it. I'm not sure if that would work on a smartphone. So if you would like a device from the school, um, Ms. Gossett, who is over all technology stuff, she's like the assistant superintendent of technology. She said to let me know, then I'll let her know, and you guys would have a laptop if you want a laptop. 
if you get a full laptop, it's already installed. You wouldn't have to install anything. So we'll be able to take that off like once the testing is done? Um, like if it's on your own device? Yes. Yeah, when, once you do the AP exam and you submit it and all that, you can take it back off. But you need to have it installed or else they won't let you take the exam. That's to, like, prevent cheating? Correct. Do you think it could be, like, an LEQ? It could be, but I don't think it will. I think if they do an LEQ, it's going to be one where they're going to give you three prompts and you would pick one. Okay. Um, I could ass I, what I've assigned so far on AP classroom are SAQs and multiple choice. Um, after tomorrow, since you brought it up, um, if they tell me that it's going to be an LEQ, then I'll assign some LEQs for you guys to do, and I can give you feedback on those. So, like, if we miss two of them, we already, we, we like, just failed the test? Um, so we get, like, 33. Well, it, like I said, I'm just, I'm just guessing because I don't really know. My guess is this. My guess is if you get if, – if they do three SAQs, right, and if you get one of them right, my guess is they're probably going to give you a two for the exam score. My guess is if you got two out of three right, you would get either a three or a four. I'm not sure. And if you got all three of them right, they'd give you a five. I have no idea. I'm, I'm just guessing. I don't know any of this until – they publish stuff, but I'm just trying to answer your question. Why did this happen this year? It couldn't happen like last year. Like this. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've got all kinds of opinions on it, but I, I can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about it. We just got to try to roll as best we can. One of the things to keep in mind is, as far as I'm aware, if you back out and don't take the exam and you pass the course, you will not get AP credit. You'll only get honors credit. So it, I, you would, you should still take the exam. Remember the state is paying for you to take the exam. Um, anything else from anybody? No. No, sir. All right. Um, I was going to ask, uh, Nyla a question, but I think I can email that to you, Nyla, if that's all right. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, if anybody's got any uh, specific questions or concerns i've got office hours at three um if not um you know just keep up with the reading i think we only have one more week's worth of reading and we'll go over that on the ninth okay all right, all right. see you guys bye bye, bye.